Welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast, the Security Awareness Series, Episode 162. I'm Chris Hadnagy, founder and CEO of Social Engineer and the Innocent Lives Foundation, and started SE Org and been doing this since way back in 2009, if you can believe that. I'm normally joined by Ryan, but he's having some technical difficulties here today, so hopefully he'll be able to pop in at some point during the show, but we all know and love Ryan. Don't get worried. He'll be here. He's just having some issues with the internet. As always, this episodes are sponsored by Social Dash Engineer LLC, where your premier security vendor. <laughs> well, we could be if you call us, but we know what we do. We love to do vishing, phishing, anything to do with social engineering. And we don't just like to do it. We actually make it our life's work to understand how humans make decisions so we can help you stay protected and more secure. You can check us out, uh, social dash engineer.com. See what we're doing over there. Check out the different services that we have. Also, if you're really into social engineering, do you know that we have a Slack channel? There's over a thousand people in there now every day talking about everything from psychology to pretext to jobs that they have. We actually have a employment forum in there. We've had seven people find jobs with different companies on that. So pop on in, join it. You don't have to be an expert. We got lots of people there learning, just asking questions. It's a family friendly atmosphere. So please come on in. And as always, we want to give a big shout out to Clutch, one of the best rock bands on the planet. Uh, they're the music for this show and also good personal friends. So check them out at pro-rock.com, which brings me to the ILF since Neil is on the board of that. Uh, Innocent Lives Foundation, if you haven't heard of that, please check it out at innocentlivesfoundation.org. It's a nonprofit I run that helps law enforcement track down people who are preying on children. And if you haven't heard, our guest today, his company, just held a 24-hour Banterathon. If you don't know what that is, you can check it out on YouTube. We're literally 24 hours long of some of the most amazing content that has ever been produced on the internet, all for the benefit of ILF. And last but not least, um, we have our human behavior conference. It used to be the human hacking conference, but we changed the name to the human behavior conference. And it's going to be live in March 24 through 26 of 2022. It's a three day conference at the Rosen Center in Orlando here. And we're inviting everyone to come check it out at humanbehaviorcon.com. And because I really love all the people that are commenting and coming to us from the podcast, I'm putting a discount code here. It's HUB150. Get $150 off the ticket. So H-U-B-E-150. Okay, let's get to the meat here while we're all here. This month, I am joined by my good friend, John Strand from Black Hills Information Security. John has been consulting with hundreds of companies and organizations in areas of security, regulatory compliance, and penetration testing. Everyone has ever heard John speak. You know this is true. Coveted speaker. We all love listening to you, John. And he's a much-loved SANS instructor. Uh, he's also a contributor to the industry, industry shaping penetration testing execution standard. Whew, I said it. And 20 critical control frameworks. Now, he also loves mountain biking, but he loves even more getting hurt at mountain biking. He loves sucking at surfing, and he loves doing it all to heavy metal music. John? Thanks for coming on the show, man. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's absolutely super cool to be here. Um, you know, the Innocent Lives Foundation that we did, the 24-hour pre-show banter conathon. I will never do that again. Um, we will absolutely <laughs> do fundraisers for ILF, but uh, we're not going to do it over 24 hours because I think we can make I, just I as much it. money and still get to bed. On time. I, I, uh, when you guys said 24 hours, I'm like, well, they're going to take shifts, right? No, no, you guys are machines. I don't know how you did it. I don't. Uh, you, so, I, so we weren't going to, like, whenever Jason Blanchard said, uh, Banjo Cla Crash Land on, on Twitter, he's like, we're going to do this. I'm like, no, we're not. And he's going, we're going to do it for the kids. I'm like, oh. <laughs> you can't say no to that. <laughs> no, um, but no, we, you know, for, for our t-shirt sales and uh spearfish general store, we say all the profits go to you guys uh, as well, which is funny because there are no profits in our store. That sells yeah. <laughs> and breaches and t-shirts, but we, we do donations all the time because, you know, we got the power to use our skills for the purposes of good and not evil. And yeah. I do not, I do not want to be on my deathbed. And look back on my career and with my last breath say, at least my networks were compliant. <laughs> There's so much more to what we can do in the world. And that's yeah. huge. So I commend you guys and your team. Well, so. No, thank you. I mean, let us, we, when, when, uh, oh, wait, look who's here. No, no. Oh, ah, maybe, maybe. Ah. No, he's just teasing oh, us. He's just teasing us, John. Try, try. You know, when, um, 
people always say that, but I'm telling you, like the, the nonprofit world works on people who are willing to spend their time and effort in helping us raise money. And you, I mean, our goal was what a thousand dollars. I think that was our goal. Yeah. We set the, we set the bar really low knowing that yeah. we would just smash it. Um, you know, under <laughs> you didn't just smash it. I mean, it was ridiculous, man, but that's, but the, okay. So that gets into another thing, you know, one of the things, you know, we're, we're, we're always trying to push, like you talk about nonprofits. I would go into like open source tools and things like that as well. This industry, and I'm talking like companies, we really suck at supporting the best of us and supporting the tools that we use all the time. Right. And we get so caught up. Like if you read a lot of news stories about companies, they're like, well, they got a hundred million dollars in series a funding. And that's what they're all excited <laughs> about. Um, I get really excited about whenever companies are like, here's a free tool that we created. Here's something we're releasing to the community. Here's some free training that we're offering to the community. Here's how we're helping kids. Here's how we're helping people that know nothing about computers learn how to secure their stuff. That's once again, if we, going back to deathbed, I, I don't think people are going to be like, I made a hundred million on my series. <laughs> hey, I, it, there's so much more to life yeah. uh, to doing it right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, before we go on, Ryan, yes. thanks for joining, man. We were, we, I did your whole announcement, oh, said great. you were going to be here, thanks. but I didn't think you were going to make it because of internet happy. problems. Yeah. I'm hot spotting. So hopefully yeah, this works. We're out. happy. <laughs> so, um, so John, let's, let's back up a little bit because I, I'm sure everyone, you know, is familiar with your name because you've been around the community for so long. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> just a little side story because we always kind of hint at it, but way back when, before I ever started social engineer at all, you were integral in me starting this whole thing because you and I went out for lunch with, with Paul Asadorian at RSA yep. and we sat, I can't even remember that restaurant, but I could right see it because it was all the these windows, yep. right? Right across the street. And we sat there and I just said to you, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. And you laid out amazing information and then basically tested me, just said, well, let's see if he goes and does yeah, it. And you did. Um, you, you know, it's rare. Uh, you have done it. Um, 40 North has done it. Tim Medina at Red Siege has done it. OpenSec, um, uh, they've done it as well. But it's hard, right? You know, we talk about if you're starting a company, anytime you're presenting anywhere, anytime you're teaching anywhere, it's not the business cards you get it's or th that you give to people. It's what you get. So getting mm -hmm. the sign up, keeping in contact, doing free content, being out there, being a touchstone, um, being a mentor to as many people as you possibly can. And that's hard. Right. It, it, it'd yeah. be much easier just to be like, well, we're going to, we're going to take VC funding and we're going to do that. And that's not fun, but you know, yeah. it, the, at least the way that we built our businesses, it's ours. And I, and I don't miss, I mean, that as us as individuals, but the people that have been with us in our various companies, same thing with Dave yeah. Kennedy, right? Um, it's theirs and it, you feel a lot more yeah. ownership for what you've done. And it means a lot more. And that's something I'm really, really excited about whenever I meet somebody and they have that spark and they want to do that and they have the capability to do that. It's, it's just one of the best things ever. So how did you start? Because I mean, you know, this, we're going back now for me, 12 plus years and you were giving me advice on starting a business. So how did you get in this industry? So, so I got started. Um, so I, I was, was teaching for the Sands Institute uh, quite regularly and Northrop Grumman wanted me to start traveling where they're like, Hey, we've got this great idea. We're going to put you on an airplane on Monday and we're going to send you to, you know, Los Angeles or Ohio or Washington DC. And then you'll fly back home on Friday. So you can spend weekends with your family. <laughs> and, um, I was like, well, F that, um, we're not, we're not, yeah. we're not doing that. That's no way to live. And they're like, we're going to give you a raise. No. I'm like, it's not enough. Right. And <laughs> we moved up to the InfoSec center of the universe, uh, Deadwood, South Dakota. And, <laughs> We named the company Black Hills Information Security because I thought that I could start a security company doing security for local businesses, for like the hospital and banks and things like that. Um, here we are years later, and I think I have three customers in the state of South yeah. Dakota. It didn't quite work out. Um, but we moved up. Uh, we had uh, we had a house, uh, a van, a pickup truck that we rent that we wrecked. I wrecked it, fell off the road on, on the ice. Our van got completely riddled with mice, um, like completely infested with mice, and uh, we had twenty seven thousand dollars of credit card debt. And oh. you know, I decided this is how I'm going to start my business. Uh, so by teaching with the Sands Institute, <laughs> presenting, and then of course Paul. Once I got involved in Security Weekly. 
you know, collecting information, building up the webcasts, building up a database of emails of people that, you know, we reach out to regularly, not to sell, um, always, always to show and, you know, presentations, free training, all of that stuff. And it just grew organically. You know, we started hiring a few people here, a few people there. And, um, you know, it, it's very, very, once again, it's very, very satisfying um, that it basically started from my garage whenever we had one vehicle in the dead of winter. And I do remember it was like negative 20 when we wrecked our pickup truck. It went off the road and uh, we're walking back to our house about half a mile and it's like 10 below zero outside. And I remember seriously thinking to myself, what the hell am I doing? Like, why? <laughs> like, I can't afford a new car. I, I don't think I can make ends meet for like the next month. And, um, yeah, you know, just kept going at it. You know, you basically live on that edge, as you know, you live on that edge sometimes for like 10 years. Cause if, even if you have 15 yeah. employees, you're like, Oh, I only have a month worth of capital to run this company. And you're always on that treadmill. Um, but it pays off. It pays off for sure. You know, what I, I, when I hear stories like this, one of the things I always like to mention, and, and may, maybe you have the same situation, but for me, I have to give massive credit to my wife. Oh, no. Yeah. Because. I mean, I was in that boat too with you, right? I mean, just st that first five, six, seven years was struggle. And she stuck by me, letting me right. get this thing going and never doubted me and never like pushed me off a cliff, which <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm surprised, but that it, I give lots of credit to the spouses who let us do Dude, this. My, my joke is that, that I, I've got a problem in my marriage. And the problem in our marriage <laughs> is that neither my wife or I can say no to each other. So it's like, I'm going to start a security company. We're going to move up to South Dakota. She's like, okay. She's like, we're going to get a bunch of cows. We're going to be fencing over the next couple of weeks. I'm like, okay. Um, it's just like, you know, you know, I, I hear people and they're like, oh, I don't know if the wife's going to let me do that. I, I, that's, oh, I hate that statement. Uh, but yeah, I don't know yeah. what that's like. And she's just yeah. always like right there. We're going to start another business. We're going to do products. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And we got each other and we're supportive of it. And I think that's why we're successful and also insane. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't know this. You have, you have cows. Yes. Yes. So we've got about <laughs> 200 acres. You, you know, Wagyu, right? Like you go out to the high end restaurants. And yeah. Like Kobe beef. Yeah. So I've got, I've got Wagyu cattle, um, which is kind of funny. Because when I bought, like, it was a cow calf pair and then I bought a bull. No, no, I bought cow calf pair and then a pregnant cow. And uh, the lady that sold it was like, You're not planning on getting into large scale production, are you? I'm like, No. She's like, <laughs> Okay, you can join the Wagyu Club. Because they're like super exclusive. They don't want a lot of Wagyu steak out there because it's a cow. You can raise them, and sell them. <laughs> it's like any other cow, you know, but they want yeah. to keep the market as small as possible. Um, so I think we've got about 28 head of cow. Of wow. Cows. So, you know, I get the full cow experience um, with almost none of the stress of being a rancher. Like ranchers are like, oh, we're not going to be able to make ends meet because the well's dry. And we're all going to die. That's like Thursday for a rancher. And uh, for me, it's just like we're cool. Um, but I love taking care just the of the phrase cows. full cow experience. Yep. I've got the full, cow experience. <laughs> I, I, I pray checked cows where you basically get this, like this glove condom thing that goes up to your shoulder and you can, reach oh, no. in. and then you also oh. sometimes got to pull cows where you got to reach in and you know, Paul's got no. that 50 gallon <laughs> drum of lube, KY uh, jelly. Yeah. Yes. yes. So <laughs> that made sense to me. Um, when I went to the studio and Paul and Larry are like, who has 50 gallons of KY jelly? I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Because if you're a large scale ranching operation and you're pulling calves in the spring, there's always time to loop. Uh, for that. So. Well, guys, you, you heard it on the social engineer podcast. <laughs> yes, that's right. No. So. <laughs> okay. So back to InfoSec. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was um, a, lot of, a lot of crossover with with Infosec there. None, with and that's the point, right? Because <laughs> no, no, that's that absolutely not. the point. Because in this, industry, there's no Chris, crossover. You know what it's like. Even when back then, we were sitting at the table, and people were coming up and having like Paul or you or like they were having a sign crap. Like I think it happened like yes, yeah. right? Or we're walking yeah. over and everyone's like Chris, Chris. So you get this head uh, on yourself. You're like, well, I'm king. You will lose that very quickly whenever you're scooping cow crap out of a corral because it's a great equalizer <laughs> and it basically kind of wicks the infosec thought leader out of you. <laughs> I, 
Yeah. I, well, I'm, I have found other ways to That's do good. that. Um, besides having cows. Um, but uh, thank you for that. Uh, so <laughs> I love the story of, uh, working with the, with the offer for a raise to go travel and never see your family because I think, Many of us have probably been in a situation in this industry where we had a job offer that seemed like a ridiculous amount of money, but the sacrifice was, you don't get to see your family ever again. Mm. Um, I actually had a job offer like that. And when I said no, they went, listen, like, just think about the amount of things you can buy your family. And I'm like, when? <laughs> I won't see them. Why? Right. Like, exactly and I don't think my kids want me to buy them stuff. I think they want me yeah. and, there. And, and, dude, I know <laughs> where that ends. That ends in divorce. Um, yeah. this industry is riddled with people that, you know, chased that dragon and, uh, they're, they're, they're divorced yeah. and I don't care how much money it's like, you know, we're going to offer you this amount of millions of dollars and you're like, great. So I'll get about half. And they're like, why? Because if I take this, I'm not going to see my <laughs> wife and she's going right. to take yeah. of it and she'll be justified in it as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you kept to that path. You had some hard years. What was the, what was the point where all of a sudden you started to see, okay, this is going to work. I'm going to like, this business is going to happen. I can tell you, I can tell you the exact time. Um, the first time we did Wild West Hack and Fest. Um, what year was that? Been, I think it's five years ago now. Um, I'm not okay. exactly sure. Um, I woke up the morning, um, that we were going to have the company, um, the company, uh, like, uh, like dinner, right? And I, I, the company accounts had a million dollars in it and it was like, oh my God, it's <laughs> this weird sort of mental thing. You know, we're constantly putting every dime we make back into the company, back into the company, yes. back into the company, back yeah. into the company. And you got operating capital for three months that you need to have. But then above that, all of a sudden we had a million dollars and I woke up and I was like, I'm a millionaire. Um, and <laughs> I went to the dinner with the people and we basically said, you know, we woke up this morning and we found out we were millionaires and we're going to give everybody in the company a bonus of $10,000. And wow. we continue to do that at BHIS as, you know, the goal of this company isn't for me to get a Ferrari, um, even though I don't like Ferraris or like a yacht or any of those things. The goal of this company is to improve the lives of the employees and to basically do cool with cool people. Yeah. And they all know our bank account balances. They all know how much money we have in the, uh, uh, you know, accounts receivable, accounts payable. They know exactly where it's all out because Eric and I's money is their money. And mm -hmm. whenever we finally got to the point where we could step back and say, no, we're good. Um, you know, everything's paid off. We have this, we have three months of operating expense and just start giving it back to the employees. I think that that's finally whenever I realized that I was at the point in my career where I was very comfortable and I was very happy. Um, mm. We still get worried about projections. I mean, you know, you end up taking a yeah. huge gig. You're like, yay, crap, because you know, yeah. like you, you get that gig and it takes your whole team and then it's months before you get paid for that. It's tough, right? So yeah. really you get into this problem where your, your company is successful and you have an overabundance of abundance. And it's hard to manage that abundance, but it's easy to share it. Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's a really interesting story. Um, and I love the way you you applied that to giving back to your team. I bet that created a very um, high sense of loyalty and ownership for each person there to realize that they had a stake in making their future amazing by making this company amazing. No, and I... And, and, and the weird thing is, um, I've had a number of employees that are like, you know, I could leave and go someplace else and make more money, but like the lifestyle. Um, and I hear this dude, I hear this all the time. Like, let's talk about Dave's company, trusted sec. How many employees have you met from trusted sec that trust Dave with their lives? They got like the tattoos, yeah. you know, it's like, once yeah. you put the tattoo of the company on you, that's a pretty big <laughs> commitment at that point. Right. Yeah. Um, you look at secure ideas, you look at a lot of great companies, and it's a consistent theme that the employees, it's a lifestyle. They like, you know, they feel like they're part of it. And I just don't think you get that in a lot of really huge corporations. It's just missing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Um, you know, Ryan and I have been talking a lot about, about that the past couple of years is the culture that we create mm. 
in our, in our company, um, could mean more to some people than, than not, not saying that money is not important, but it could mean more to some people than a huge paycheck. Oh, absolutely. Is, is that, that culture. We have one young lady that worked here and she'll constantly tell us like, this is her favorite job she's ever had in her whole life Mm -hmm. because she feels like every day she can wake up and come to work and it's, and it's, she looks forward to it. Like she can't wait to come to work. And I'm like, that is maybe the most validating thing someone can say to me about my company. So right. I, <laughs> That's awesome. This weird policy. I don't hire miserable people. Um, and it's a, it's a hor- <laughs> horrible thing. Is that the trick? Okay. Because you get people, <laughs> you get people that are like, you know, Oh, my current job, it's a bunch of idiots and I hate my boss and uh, our customers are stupid. And it's a horrible thing because there are people that are in bad circumstances. Yeah. I get that. But every time I've hired someone like that, they bring that here. Right. And yeah. It's like a habit, you know, uh, you know, yeah. James, you know, habit is the flywheel of society and you get into these bad habits and then you bring them with you. So we tend to hire people when we're interviewing, we're like, this seems like a joyous, wonderful person. Well, I <laughs> hired this one guy, I'm not going to say his name and just joyous. And then he came here and he was excited and good employee, really, really, really solid. I got a letter from his wife, handwritten, and it basically laid out. You have no idea how miserable he was. Uh, you know, was struggling with depression. His job was beating mm-hmm. him down. Um, it was impacting our family. And he's like, and she put in, since he's worked with you, he's a joy to be around. I've got my husband back. And for wow. the life of me, I don't know why people put up with that. Like, why would you work at a job that is that miserable? We get into this thing. It's like, well, I got to take the crap the boss gives me. If you're an InfoSec, no, you don't. I don't, you don't want to be a jerk, right? You don't want to pull like a full intersect Karen at every little slight. But if it's truly a miserable place, you can find some place that's amazing. Um, go look, they're out there. That had to be really validating to get a letter like that. Yeah. I keep, I keep some things like that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of times where you're just like, why the hell am I doing this? And it's like, oh yeah, that's why. Yeah. 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 I agree. That's, that's kind of cool. So, um, you, you talked before we started the show, you talked a lot about training, oh, yeah. you know, uh, especially, uh, giving out free training or helping people with training or pay what you can training. Tell us a little bit about that philosophy and where that came from. So, so I retired from the Sands Institute. Um, we go back to the thing we were talking about with like family and significant others, <clears> right? <throat> and I realized that I was away from my family for like 15 years teaching for Sands, like at least a quarter of the time. And, yeah. I started kind of realizing that there was impacts on my children. There was impacts on my relationship with my wife and there was impacts on me. You know, we eat like garbage whenever we're traveling, right? It's just traveling is really hard and you're in an airport. I'm like, I want to eat something healthy. It's like I got McDonald's, Chick-fil-A. Oh, Chick-fil-A. We're going to eat a (laughs) Chick-fil-A and I needed to make a change. So I I retired from the Sands Institute and uh, I kind of swore off ever traveling and teaching again. So like even down to black hat, you know, we met at black hat. Um, you were teaching some stuff there. Black hat's a great time. I just, I want to spend more time with my family and I want to be home and at BHIS, I don't need to do that anymore. So I'm done. Well, COVID hit. And when COVID hit, there was like panic. I I don't know if you remember, but we had customers that were like, we're going to delay the pen test, you know, another month. We're going to, you know, shut these different things down. Some contracts weren't being signed and it was just a really scary, probably 30 days um, when everything was being shut down. And we started throwing poop at the wall to figure out what was going to stick. And we started up doing training. We have people showing up to the webcast that we do about, you know, anywhere between 1500 to 4,000 people show up to our webcasts. And we're like, well, let's, let's, let's try training online. And, uh, I had a couple of classes from some employees that went through Bose, uh, breaching the cloud went through and it was very successful. And, uh, I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try a pay what you can intro to security class. Hmm. Um, cause I don't need the money. And, and I'm lucky in that regard. Right. And I love to teach. I haven't taught in a while. So you know what? I'm going to teach online and I'm going to make it pay what you can, you know? And one of the big reasons why we went with pay what you can is this, this concept in the industry that everyone gets freaked out about called diversity. And it's this hot button issue. People get worked up over it and we don't have enough women. We don't have enough um, African-American specific Islanders, native Americans. We don't have enough people, you know, different sexual orientations and they're all right, 
But the thing that the industry does that I think is interesting is to deal with it. We don't really deal with it. We talk about it. And hmm. then there's companies out there that uh, do scholarships. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do scholarships for women of color. Um, we're going to do it for, uh, like I said, Pacific Islanders. They, they choose a group and they do scholarships. And their heart's in the right place. And it's life-changing many times for the people that receive those scholarships. Not begrudging that. Heart is absolutely in the right place. But it doesn't, doesn't change a damn thing in the industry. For all the well intentions and all the marketing that it gets some of these groups, it doesn't change a damn thing. And if you look at the consistency, what is the gates that exist in security? And you'll have people like, well, the gates are, you know, people want too many qualifications for entry level jobs or, you know, they're only hiring people as part of the good old boy network and all that. And all that's true. But the single biggest gate is money. Um, if you're a mom and you're, you're a single mom and you're working two jobs and you want to make your life better, you know, money <laughs> is what you need to make your life better. If you want to get into security, you either got to get a degree or you got to go get a certification. You got to get time off. You got to deal with all, you're stuck from a socioeconomic perspective. You are absolutely stuck. Um, you're African American and you grow up in a rough neighborhood. You don't have any opportunities. You're poor. You're not going to go to college. You're not going to go to a tech school. You're not going to do these things because yeah. money, I don't care who you are, where you're from, wherever you're at, your sexual orientation, anything, your religion, the barrier is money. So what's the one thing we can do that's not a scholarship, like not this band-aid, look at us, you're, we're diverse, but fundamentally changes the game. And the pay what you can model fundamentally changes the game by doing mm. pay what you can. You come, you take time, we record it. You can come in, you can take the class, you can view the recordings later. The labs are live forever as long as you can download the VM and it meets you with where you're at. And for me, this is one of those life-changing things, right? So we did this and I had a whole bunch of people that contacted me like, this is the dumbest thing I have ever seen you do. And I've seen you do a lot of dumb things. Um, <laughs> no one's, no one's going to pay. Everyone's going to take zero. They're going to pay nothing for this class and you're going to lose money and you're going to look like an idiot. You're wasting your, you expect these people that can't pay for training to hire you for pen testing services. Like, and people are like, anytime you do any marketing, you should always track back. You gave out a t-shirt. How many sales do we get off of t-shirts? F all of that. Like that's not the way that this works. And that mindset is killing the industry as a whole. So we did it and we had 5,000 people register for the first class. <sighs> And they were everywhere. Wow. We had them from India, Kuala Lumpur, Japan, China, Mongolia, um, some people from Russia. Um, it was like everywhere around the world. And then if you looked at like the names, you know, just by looking at names, you can pick out like the ethnicity of a lot of people. And the diversity was absolutely there. It was everywhere, all over the board. And the other thing that was weird is I made more in that one class than I made for teaching fees for an entire year before that. So what I made money by giving something effectively away. And then we went to, you know, I, I've done a couple of these and uh, you, we, we do really well. And now we have people that are sponsoring it, which is weird. Um, when you have Cisco or Sophos <laughs> or somebody like, we would like to sponsor your pay what you can training because you need to be making money. I'm like, I am I'm like, we'll write you a check. Seriously. You don't have to I'm like, here's my, like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so we're going to continue doing that. But it, it's, it's fundamentally changed people's lives in a positive way. And I, I, I am humbled and incredibly honored whenever I go up to a conference. I had this one lady, she came up to me at Way West Hacking Fest in Reno. And she comes up and she's like, I wanted to let you know that I literally got my job at a security operations center because I took your three classes. That was it. I didn't have a degree. I didn't have any certifications. I just put at the top of my resume that I went through pay what you can sock, pay what you can security and cyber deception. I went through those three classes and I got the job on that alone. Wow. And she came in close and she goes, they also paid for me to come here. They covered my hotel, my flight <laughs> and the fee. And I'm like, well, something that's important is that's the way it is in this industry. Like your job should be paying for that. That's the way that this works. Yeah. You don't have to whisper. Like people aren't going to be like yeah. zombies attacking you. Um, that's the way yeah. we do it here. And if you have a job that doesn't cover it, then you know what? You need to find another job. And I said, welcome aboard. 
And so far I've had about, I think seven people personally reach out to me and say that they got a job in security because of our classes that are pay what you can. Um, and that's not, we, we do paid classes too, but everything I teach from here on out will be pay what you can. Um, because it's the one thing that I can contribute to the industry to make the single biggest impact to diversity, to make the single biggest impact to the skill shortage in the industry. And I'm actually moving the needle in a way that I didn't even think would be possible. And I love it. Um, and it's been just probably one of the coolest rides I could have expected. It all came out of a horrible pandemic. <laughs> it's, that is an amazing story. Um, I tell you, one of the things that I thought of when you started talking about the pandemic is that is also something that happened to me. I was traveling so much before pandemic. And when I stopped traveling, I noticed just how much better things got for my, for me, for my health, for my family to the point where like I've, I've had now I've had some live trainings and they're all like, can we do this? I'm like, yeah, if you come to where I live. Yes, and I've been doing that. <laughs> so yes. I've made. Yeah, I made like 12 people fly from across the globe to here. And they do, right? <laughs> and they do. And I'm like, I don't want to go a on, a across the globe right now. I want you to Isn't come that here. is weird though? Like you sometimes feel like they're invading your your space. I mean, I do a lot of training here for the military. Yeah. They fly people out and we hang out and yeah. they're horribly confused because they flew into Rapid City Regional Airport in South Dakota. <laughs> and there's like, there's 20 of us and we're going to learn hacking in Spearfish, South Dakota. <laughs> and it's just like, well, come on in. And it, it, yeah. it's somewhat like, <laughs> yeah. like really cool. But at the same time, it's, it's a little awkward. Like this isn't the way it's supposed yeah. to be, but it feels right. But I get to go home with right? my family every night. Yep. Right. And eat dinner with my family every night <gasps> and not have to eat ho um, airport Chick-fil-A. Oh, so much, man. <laughs> Only so much. So, but I still miss DerbyCon. Um, there's like a little yeah. part of me that sometimes I want to reach out to Dave and be like, you know what? Can I resurrect DerbyCon? Um, <laughs> and he doesn't have to do anything but just show up and look pretty because damn, he looks pretty. I mean, it's really, the, it's, I had, I hope he doesn't listen to this because I'm going to say it. He, he does. does. Look great. Oh, he knows. Dude, you don't post, put, put pictures. I know, but I don't want him like to know Twitter. I know it. No, so yeah, we you see the Twitter posts. Knows, that's, right? he knows. Um, I don't want him to know that I know it. That's, that's it, the thing. Exactly. You know, <laughs> you guys are counting comparing <laughs> steps between y'all. And I don't want to, I know, believe shit. me, it's bad. It's bad. But I miss hanging out. Like <laughs> the one thing that, that it, we keep trying to recreate with Way West Hacking Fest and Wild West Hacking Fest is kind of that Derby Con vibe where, we get our friends together and it's low key and it's not 5,000 people, but it's like a thousand and we can sit down we can break bread with each other. We can sit in the hallway and have a conversation and it's not like you're fluttered around like DEF CON and DEF CON's awesome for what it is. ShmooCon's awesome for what it is, but I miss the intimacy and being able to hang out with my yeah. friends as, as though they're friends and you don't feel like you're getting just yeah. crushed. Yeah, those first four years at De DerbyCon, sitting in the lobby playing chess with Egypt, oh my God. having a drink with H.D. Moore. Like, I miss those days, man. Those were times we got to connect with people. Well, okay, so Egypt, I got a funny story about that. I'm convinced um, that Egypt was doing a hustle. I do, <laughs> I do. So let me explain. The chess, explain. The chess hustle, let me you mean? So, um, so Egypt, you know, as the night would go on, um, he, he would get drunker and drunker and, you know, slurring yeah. speech and stuff. And you can always tell how drunk Egypt is by his ability to juggle, right? <laughs> and there were a couple of times where he's like, and I'm watching him play chess. And I'm like, homeboy ain't drunk. He's playing us. Like, you know, this, you know, I, I think he was, instead of a pool shark, I think he was doing chess shark. <laughs> um, with that, where people are like, oh, I got this I, I guy. Believe he's it. so drunk and he's like a drunken chess master. Uh, yeah, he so is. I think the, he was, the worst loss I had was he played against two people at the same time and I was one of them and he beat us both. <sighs> Dude, I remember back in the I'm day, like, I'd play chess against like three people and lose against all of them. It was a good time. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a compl accomplishment. <laughs> 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 so this, uh, so, uh, the, uh, back to your, your, your training, um, quite amazing. 5,000 people. How did you manage training 5,000 oh, people? Easy. Um, so years ago you talked about the OSCP. Um, I remember we were all uh, like, I was getting like snacks out front and OSCP had like 30 students and they had like four, four <laughs> instructors in the room and they all come out and they're sucking wind. They're like, Oh my God. Oh, geez. We got like all these students in these labs. Oh my God. It's kicking our ass. And Paul was with me and he's like, well, John's got 89 students and it's him. 
And they're like, well, you don't have any labs? I'm like, no, we've got like seven a day. And they're like, how do you do that? And I'm like, dude, I try harder. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> so, and by the Woo. way, I want you all to know I love the OSCP. I think it's an amazing thing. Yeah, I yeah but that's great. <laughs> but anytime I can throw a little shade at that phrase, I'm going to. Oh, yeah, that. yeah, so, definitely. <laughs> so techniques for teaching 5,000 people. Um, technique number one, have a Discord server set up. Um, technique number two, uh, make sure that your labs are as smooth as silk, like literally copy and paste, uh, pro tip number three, make sure that you have videos of your labs, even though you explain them in the class, you can tell the students, Hey, you can go through this. You can walk through the lab or if you're having trouble, you can just watch the video instead. And if it fails, a bunch of those students are going to actually, they're going to do that, right? They're going to watch the video. They're like, ah, it's not working. I'll watch the video because that's what we do. They'll binge it. Um, pro tip number four, I have a cyber range for challenges for your more advanced students so they don't get bored. So whenever they're working through the labs, they're like, this is stupid and easy. Well, here's a cyber range for you with some challenges. Go, you genius 10X engineer, you go. <laughs> and mm -hmm. off they go. And then they can chew on that. Um, the final thing that I think is really cool with the Discord server is they start self-regulating and answering their own questions. So hmm. I'll be watching Discord while I'm teaching and someone will ask a question like, you know, what was the OS command? And somebody else will answer it. I don't have to. Somebody will say, I'm getting this error in VMware. And somebody will say, oh, you need to enable virtualization in your BIOS. What's your make and model? He'll say, this <laughs> is my make and model. And somebody will say, great, here's the key combination to fix that. It's amazing because whenever you bring the community in, they're actually my TAs. Um, they're actually my co-instructors and they're working and they're feeding off of each other and they're helping each other out. Um, I do have TAs that are now helping um, in a channel that we have set up that's troubleshooting. If you have any issues, they're there to kind of help troubleshoot it. Um, we call them um, nerd herders or community support <laughs> ninjas. They, they like the nerd herder right. name. I like it. Um, so we, stick, we stuck with that. And basically just having, you know, this whole entire thing is locked down and as smooth as you possibly can. And then the final thing is, dude, I've been teaching for 17 years. Um, 98% of the questions that the students are going to ask, I am able to work that into the presentation before they ask those questions. And that's just because I know on this slide, they're going to ask this question on this thing. They're going to ask this on this thing. They're going to ask this. And that's mm -hmm. just, that's just repetition. And you've been teaching forever. You know what that's like. You go to a slide and you're like, yeah. there's someone that's going to ask this question. And you either yeah. wait for it so you can look like a God or you just preempt it and you just go. Um, <laughs> but no, it, it, it scales really well. Um, and it, you know, make your labs not complicated. Keep it simple. Stupid is really a big part of it. Um, but mm -hmm. no, it, it's, it's a head rush. Um, it's absolutely a head rush having that many people. And whenever you yeah. get rolling and you say a joke on discord and discord explodes, <laughs> um, it can be somewhat difficult, uh, to kind of keep up with all the banter, but it, it's, it's, it's connecting in a way that I just never have had anything like it before. So you do your training on discord. No, we actually, well, we got to fix this. Um, so we're using go to webinar. Um, we're going to be switching over to zoom. Um, the reason why yeah. we're using go to webinar is we've always used go to webinar and go to webinar can scale to about 3000 people before it just pukes and dies. And they'll tell you otherwise. Um, uh, but then they get a little afraid when they find out that you can actually have 3000 people show up. Um, you can stream it over <laughs> to YouTube. That's YouTube can handle about anything, right? We don't even compare to like a Twitch stream at all. But it's very yeah. difficult to kind of lock it off a little bit for the people that have registered. Um, so we're going to be switching over to Zoom and doing it that way. What we do with Discord, even though you can use OBS and you can hook it into Discord and you can stream right on Discord, um, Discord politely asked us to not do that. Um, so what we use Discord is you get two links. You get a link for the class to watch it. And then you get a link for the communication and discord is that link for the communication with the students and the instructor. So we literally have both going simultaneously and having that level of separation is really good. And it also gives us backup. So if go to webinar dies or zoom dies or whatever, then I can jump into discord and I can jump in and I can start doing it there at a last resort. So backups to backups to backups are important. So totally not a related question, but Discord versus Slack. Why? Um, <clears throat> because Discord kicks Slack's ass. Um, <laughs> if you okay, so if Slack is great if you have a team and you have a group of people that you want to share some information, like you got the Bloodhound Slack, you guys have your Slack channel, and you have a community, like a community of interest on a specific thing. 
If you want to create a huge community, Discord is where it's at because Discord is what all the Twitch streamers, it's what all the cool kids are doing and it scales really well. Um, it has a bunch of features built into it um, to handle large groups of people. So we found that Slack is was great for like a handful of people, but I think our Slack is at like 35, 40,000 or sorry, Discord is at 35 or 40,000 people right now. Um, and to be able to have that community working, Discord just works so much better than Slack, a community of that size. And that's a preference thing, right? And then I have people that are like, well, Slack can do X, Y, and Z, and that's fine. This works exceptionally well for what we're doing for webcasts and setting up multiple rooms and making it easy for people to jump back and forth without requiring invites and managing the number of users. It just, Discord works really, really well for what we do and at the scale that we're actually doing it at. Yeah, we um, I I get pressured sometimes to move our channel over to Discord, but I haven't taken the bite. Maybe I'm, I'm not I'm gonna one tell of the you cool this, kids. Dude, if your channel's working for you on Slack, go with it. Um, it is. Stick with it. Whenever it, it starts breaking at the seams, then start thinking about it. Because one of the things you don't want to do is you don't want to move just because it's the cool thing, right? Um, you yeah. want to move no. with valid reasons. And our reasons were five, ten, fifteen, up to like twenty thousand people, and uh, that that made it made it, made it a no brainer. Also with like restream and all the tools that we're using for integration and tying all this stuff together. Um, and with like restream, we can pull discord comments. We can merge those with the YouTube comments simultaneously while we're presenting, dump that into a video stream. So there's a lot of things that we get from it. Yeah. I'm used to not being cool, so it's okay. No, dude, I was using <clears throat> Pearl for a long time. And nowadays, if you mention <laughs> Pearl, people are like, what? Yeah. I live um, okay. So <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, I realized we've been going for a while, but talking with you is so easy. Like I can just kind of, we can just chat for, well, 24 hours, you know, Done. I mean, it, it really can happen. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, let me, let me, let me finish up with a few questions that we like to ask. Sure. Um, so based on some of the things we talked about, like especially getting into the industry, um, you know, look, looking to, to give back to the community. What are some things that you would say to, to somebody listening to this that they can take action right now? What advice would you give Don't them? Don't be a wizard. Don't try to be a wizard. There's hmm. nothing more annoying than wizards trying to impress other wizards. Um, like if you remember back in the day, you'd walk around DEF CON and there'd be someone that's like, oh, I wrote a zero day at this particular thing and blah, 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 blah. And I remember I was, um, I was sitting with, uh, Atlas, um, at, at, uh, DEF CON. And he's won multiple black badges at DEF CON. And, you know, he, he, there was somebody that came up to him and was like, oh, I wrote, a, I wrote a zero day for Adobe. And he's like, who hasn't? Um, <laughs> the point is don't try to impress other wizards because if you do that, you're going to impress like 10 people, 15 people. You'll feel cool. Yeah. The basics and fundamentals are what this industry needs. We don't need another Spectre, Meltdown, Rowhammer, um, Heartbleed, all of these cutting edge vulnerabilities. There's people, we absolutely do need those people, but we don't need more of those people. We need people that can do the basics and fundamentals. So if you do a video on Nmap, awesome. You do a video on Nessus, awesome. You do a video on how network protocols work, rock on. Don't hold yourself back for sharing with the community and YouTube and in blog posts and all these different things, just because you think it's basic and no one's going to care to learn because someone is going to care to learn and you're going to resonate and connect with somebody and you're going to help them solve their problem. So get out there and do that. The other thing is it helps you when you're getting a job. If you're trying to get a job and you're like, here's my YouTube channel, here's my medium for blogs, here's all this stuff. Your resume is going right up to the tippy top and that's where you want to mm -hmm. be. So give back, even if it's basic stuff. You know, I love that advice. Um, so many times, especially when people are looking to like get a career in SE, they think they need to come up with the next biggest thing, but we haven't changed in human history. We haven't changed the medium in which we perform the attacks changes, but not much else. So I keep telling people the same thing. Just write something about fishing, write something about something basic. SE keep it is basic. Amazing because they're stories, they're narratives. Right. They're visceral. Yeah. And what's more important yeah. the, 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 for all the that I've done in my career, I get up and I tell a story about my mom breaking into a prison, right? And that is the <laughs> visceral story that people remember. I'm now like, I'm now known as like, Hey, you, you're, you're John, you're, you're Rita's son. 
awesome. I'll take right. it. Right? It's a right. visceral story. And that's how human beings catalog and learn. And that's a beautiful thing in the SE world. Yeah. And it's all everyone's perspective yeah. too. So everyone oh, has a different perspective on the same thing. So you can view it very differently and you give your perspective, it might resonate with a whole different group of people. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. What would you say your favorite books are like, and you know, they don't have to be about this topic. It could be anything you've read that you really like. Um, so I, I, this is the timing of it. The, the new movie Dune came out and it was done so well. Um, but I love Dune. Dune is one of those books that I've read five times, um, started reading hmm. it in high school and I just kept going. And it, it's funny because, you know, why, why are people kind of attracted to Dune? And by the way, Token hated Dune, um, absolutely hated it. <laughs> And the reason why I hate it is it didn't have an uplifting narrative and a hero and evil, but Frank Herbert wasn't about that. Uh, with Dune, many people don't know this. And they're going to find out in the next movie that there's a tremendous amount of deconstructing the Messiah hero complex. And there's going to be a huge amount of what is the danger of the Messiah hero complex. And in Dune, in the first movie, uh, if you saw it, um, there's a scene where he sees the future in the Holy War and he freaks out about what's going to happen in his name. And he wants to get away from it. And I love that narrative of becoming so large that you become a monster, um, becoming hmm. something, walking away from that and becoming something smaller and not allowing yourself to get so big that you forget who you are, your head so far up your own that you can't see anymore. Um, that goes back to what we were talking about before with like shoveling cow crap and things like that. I've seen so many people in this industry that get big and they don't stay humble and they don't continue to give back. I've seen so many people in this industry that believe that they were at where they're at because they're just brilliant. And it's not a mixture of brilliance and luck and the support of thousands of people um, over your lifetime. And I love that in the book. Um, I lo also really like uh, the book, All the Birds in the Sky. Um, uh, hmm. Charlie Jane Anders is a, it's a great book about a mad scientist and a witch. Um, um, so that's a great book. Uh, Yigne Zamiatin's We, um, if you read, um, 1984, Orwell ripped it off from the Yigne Zamiatin. Um, Master hmm. and Margarita, uh, by the book, Bogolkov is an amazing, amazing Russian novel. Um, going away from being pretentious, uh, the Mistborn series is fantastic as well. Um, in the way of the Kings. So those are some of the books that I really like. And I keep coming back to and dwelling on those books. What was the, the third one? <clears throat> I didn't get the Yigny name. Zamiatin's we, or all the birds we, in the okay. sky. Um, yeah, that was the we. Yeah, we it's I just said. we. Um, yeah. And uh, you should read it. it, it you, you'll be like, wow, George Orwell really ripped this off. And then you'll look up interviews with George <laughs> Orwell where he basically says, I ripped this off from Yigne Zamiatin, um, which <laughs> at least he's honest about it, which I think is good. <laughs> That's great. Uh, you talked a lot over this show about giving back. Who would you say is your greatest mentor? Oh, my greatest mentor. Um, I, I can drop that like easy peasy. Ed Scotus. Um, Ed Scotus. It, it is my big brother. Um, I haven't seen him in a long time. Um, but you look at that guy and the number of people that he taught in the industry, right? Yeah. And there's, there's almost not a hacker around today. You know, people that present at DEF CON, they've taken 504 or 560. He, he is, he's much larger than people give him credit for. And people oftentimes, yeah. you know, they don't, maybe they don't know who he is, which I find shocking. Um, but then the holiday hack challenge, Right. Like, you know, we talk about giving back to the community and doing free stuff. Like the man's out there and he was giving presentations all the time and he's giving us holiday hack challenges for free. And I'm going to tell you, like, he gets pressure a lot. Like we should charge for the holiday hack challenge and do that. No, oh, man, he keeps it for free. I'm convinced that everything that man does uh, from teaching to trying to make a living is just so we can keep doing the holiday hack challenge <laughs> because that's his passion. And there's a ton of people yeah. that are learning security through the holiday hack challenge. And no, Ed, Ed is, Ed is, um, Ed is my North star, uh, starting up in guardians, Wait. what he does for the community, the people that he taught, how he presents. I, I wish I could hold myself together as well as he does. Um, cause I'm kind of <laughs> like a nasty, crazy free radical, uh, moving around in a bunch of circles, but Ed Scotus. I, uh, we had him on the show and he talked a lot about the holiday hack challenge. 
but I told him one of my favorite Ed Skoda stories is um, giving away pies at DerbyCon. <laughs> yeah, on Pie Day. Just, right, just, just giving away pies. Like the guy would just go buy a couple dozen pies and sit there and just give out slices of pie to people for no reason at all at a hacker con. So right outside you, the SC village. Gotta Did love you want that. A weird <laughs> bit of trivia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I got started in computer security working the Department of Interior's um, uh, Cobell versus Norton lawsuit, which is the world's largest class action lawsuit. Uh, misappropriation of Native American funds by the Department of Interior. Judge Lambert was a judge who hired a pen testing company. This would have been like 2000, 2001 timeframe um, to break into the Department of Interior and see how hard it would be to steal Native American funds. And I was uh, just a little help desk technician and I was able, there's more to the story, but I was able to detect one of the attacks that they did. The RPC stat D vulnerability it was a format string attack. And I was able to detect it in logs. And uh, I basically went to management, almost got fired. They thought I was the hacker that did it because I was the one that caught it. So that's another long story. But years later, I'm, I'm telling the story at the lunchroom um, of, of Sands Orlando and Mike poor, who's like Ed Scotus, best friend in the whole wide world. Mike like gets whiter than he normally is. And he looks at me and he goes, dude, do you know who the hacker was that did that attack? I'm like, no, he goes, it was Ed. <laughs> um, so Ed oh. denies this. He can neither <clears throat> confirm nor deny this. Right. And he, that's the way he is. But Ed Scotus actually got me started in computer security by breaking into the Department of Interior. And that's how I got started in computer security. And Ed Scotus was the instructor that murder boarded me and evaluated me to become an instructor for the Sands <laughs> Institute. Um, so I like Ed and his family never pay for a dinner with me ever. Never once. Yeah. So. I love having that. That's a great story. You have great stories, man. You really, really do. Um as always, John, I can sit here and talk to you for hours. It's just a, a, always a fascinating conversation. And every time I talk with you, I learn something new. I did not know uh, what I what I now know about cows, and I, nor, nor did I need to know that. You can't um, unsee it. Man. I'm not going to unsee it ever. Um, and uh, and I didn't know you were a surfer either. That's new. So, uh, That's new. But yeah, dude, one of these days, um, um, I'll talk to we're you. We're going to have to do that together because I love we're surfing. Go surfing. Let me know when and where. I'll but, be there. Uh, where do you surf in South Dakota? I don't Dakota, surf in South friend. Dakota. Costa Rica is usually okay. where I surf, but I will surf anywhere. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's um, okay. I need about okay. a nine or a 10 foot board and, uh, I can yeah. Get, um, almost everything. That's the way to go, man. Long boards are the way yeah. to go. It's just so beautiful and wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, guys. I got to go okay. to another John, meeting. Okay. John, thank you. Yeah. It was great. Great having you. And you can join us next month where we'll have another expert on the show on the security awareness series. Thank you and see you.